Um, so um, next we have um, um, Michael Lord, a member of the Board of Trustees of Historic uh, Hudson Valley, and he's going to discuss another aspect of um, slavery, people, not property. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I pretty much don't have anything more to say after these guys. Uh, thank you guys, that was really terrific. I, I really appreciate that because they can kind of bring that story up into the later 19th century, whereas I'm gonna kind of talk a little bit about the earlier uh, colonial period of uh, enslavement in New York and in the North. So uh, let me first of all uh, thank the town board for inviting me to speak today, uh, especially uh, Supervisor Paul Feiner for making that request and town clerk Judith Bevel for inviting me into her committee, uh, the 400 Years Project of the Greenberg African American Alliance. Um, I'm going to start with a, a little bit of a proverb. The Igbo uh, in eastern Nigeria have a proverb, until the elephants have their own historians, tales of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Um, history is often History is often really a matter of perspective and power, I think. Um, I'm a historian, I've been a public historian for 30 years now, uh, and I recognize that it is no longer enough for us to simply celebrate our history. It's really time to present our history from multiple perspectives, multiple sides of that story, and it's time to learn from that past as well. Historic Hudson Valley, uh, where I work, uh, is a, a group of five historic sites uh, along the river towns. Uh, maybe you guys have heard of us, like Phillipsburg Manor, Washington Irving Sunnyside, Jack-o'-lantern Blaze, you know. We've been presenting a variety of histories over the years. But if you've been to Phillipsburg Manor, really within the last 20 years or so, uh, I think maybe you've noticed a little change in our perspective and the way we tell the stories at Phillipsburg. Um, around 1998 or so, uh, Phillipsburg Manor made a decision to actively research the story of the enslaved community that lived at Phillipsburg Manor throughout much of the 18th century. We know from primary documents there were 23 enslaved men, women, and children at Phillipsburg Manor. Um, we know that Phillipsburg Manor encompassed about 52,000 acres of land, including all the river towns. It was about three and a half times the size of Manhattan, and it was called a provisioning plantation. That was news to me when I came here those 20 years ago. Uh, I had studied enslavement, but mostly in the South, and I came to uh, Phillipsburg Manor to write that story of enslavement uh, in the colonial North. And it struck me calling this place a plantation, because you don't often think plantations on the Hudson River. That's a little bit outside the box, I think, and a surprise to a lot of people. And a learning experience, because we had to debunk so much of those stories that slavery in the North was somehow kinder or gentler or it wasn't as important or it was fewer in numbers and didn't last very long. And for 20 years we've been telling that story. About five years ago we made a decision to move that story to a larger stage. We can bring people to Phillipsburg, but we can only bring so many people to Phillipsburg. We made a choice to uh, pursue an online, what we call an interactive documentary called People Not Property. People Not Property is stories of enslavement throughout the colonial north, so we brought it to a, a much bigger audience. What People Not Property is, let me see if I can find it here for you, is an interactive documentary, really that's just fancy speak for uh, a nice website. It's a website that allows a lot of user choice. So it is a bit of a documentary, but it allows people to kind of move around and see this story from multiple perspectives. It's free. This is open for anybody that has an internet connection and can get to hudsonvalley.org. That's our website, and it is for use for, we understand for teachers, for students, for anybody interested in history, anybody who wants to understand a little bit about this story. We intended it for it to be free. We intended it to be for the public domain. We are a nonprofit. That's sort of what we try to do. It's our mission. It's a slick interaction. It tells the story of more than 80 personal stories of enslaved individuals throughout the colonial north, from 
places like Massachusetts and New Hampshire, through New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, are the places where we don't often associate the stories of enslavement. The user has a lot of control over this. I can navigate to this little menu button over here and it will show you quickly our four chapters. Defining slavery, where we get into the story of how this originated, uh, how it became uh, considered to, con how you could consider a person to be considered property through legal definitions. Stories of being enslaved, of what it was like to be a skilled laborer or marriage under enslavement, raising families, elders, community and culture. Choosing resistance, there's a lot of agency in this. People made choices, even as enslaved individuals, they chose what they could be doing, uh, in many instances, to resist that situation, covertly and overtly. And pursuing justice, how enslavement uh, slowly ended in the colonial north through things such as gradual emancipation, and also some of the ways that this story is and continues to be relevant today. I want to show uh, the introductory video for just a moment, just to see if we can get an understanding of what some of this is about here. Let's see if everything's going to work. Yeah. Slavery underpinned the exploration of the Americas and the money that was made by Europeans in the Americas in the colonial era. Slavery was not just a southern institution. It was an American institution. The story of enslavement in the colonial north is not a short time This is part of the development of America as we know it today. What made us profitable and wealthy was built on the backs of enslaved laborers. When an important story like slavery in the colonial north is left out because it doesn't contribute to people's good feelings, that shortchanges history and people's understanding of our past and how we came to be the way we are today. We have not killed in this person. It's easy for us to think about saying this been something that was in the past and a long time ago. But it very much affects the way we as a nation have grown and how we have struggled with race relations since that was. I believe the lack of knowledge of slavery and law is not just ignorant. Um, and I do think that the New York has to own up to what has taken place. There are burial grounds in New York City, some in Westchester County, and the slaves are there. So why do these people here, how did they get here? Their bones and their remains are there. We have to pay attention to the records that the people left us and to the little shreds of evidence that they left us about their lives. I think talking about real people, that existed, and say people know who their, their names are. These are incredibly important Knowing somebody's story can affect you. And I think that's really important in the education of humanity. Some of them left narratives in the colonial period, very few, but we get stories about them that lets us know that this was a person who had a family. This was a person who cared about somebody else in the world. This was a person who took pride in his work or took pride in her work. And to think about them as whole people, even though they were also property. I do think the North will come to terms with this too. I think people are finally ready to really pick up the issue of slavery in all of its implications. I think the website is going to also come in the September learning process. And the more people learn, the more they listen, the more they will have change. As a learning tool, I think this is going to be very helpful for, um, for schools and for students as well. Uh, it is in sort of bite-sized chunks. It's not a two-hour documentary that you have to watch from beginning to end. And uh, it allows for people to kind of jump around in that story to see something that might resonate with them. Um, for example, if we're going to look at a place like Phillipsburg Manor, which is just around the corner here, uh, there is um, a primary document that we use at Phillipsburg Manor. It's the Phillipsburg Manor Inventory, 
the estate was taken at the time of Adolf Phillips's death. It was actually in 1750, even though it reads here 1749. They had a weird calendar back then, and they didn't really have New Year's until March. But enough history. <laughs> Um, this is a document that we uh, have had in our archives for, um, for centuries. The very first page of this probate inventory taken lists the names of 23 men, women, and children on the site, followed by cattle, horses, silverware, and other things. It hits home really as a document that really shows what it is to be considered an object in the eyes of the law in the 18th century. And what we've decided to do here is sort of discuss some bits of this information for people that might want to know a little bit more about, kind of read between the lines of this document. So we have a, a list of Caesar here. And if we click on Caesar, we read a little bit about the man who was the miller at Phillipsburg Manor, a highly skilled position, man who could read, who could write, uh, and had a lot of responsibility uh, at Phillipsburg Manor. And all the money that he uh, earned for the Phillipses, none of it came back to Caesar or to his family at all. Uh, we have stories about uh, the women on the property, Massey, and her unnamed child was sold to the Van Horn family on April 19, 1750. We're pretty sure the child was Hendrick, although the child was not named in the bill of sale. Uh, so this document can really open up a lot of different ways for people to experience the past and to really try to make this personal and human. And that's what we're trying to do with this story. It's not on the institution of enslavement. It is the personal stories that I think connect people uh, with the past. As you've seen in the first opening video, you had a number of scholars uh, that we worked closely with, Dr. Leslie Harris, uh, currently at uh, Northwestern University in Chicago. Uh, she literally uh, wrote the book on slavery in New York. Two books, actually, on slavery in New York. She is a wonderful woman, and it was terrific to have, to have her here um, to really move this story along and really make this story significant. Uh, Heather Williams uh, from the University of Pennsylvania is a professor of law and really broke down the ideas of what it was to be considered uh, legal property, even though you're a human being. Um, so these scholars were very good for us. We have an advisory board, an African American advisory board at Phillipsburg Manor at Historic Hudson Valley, uh, and they guided us. Most of them are retired teachers, so they were a great group of folks to work with, uh, to help us guide this story, to ensure that this story is gonna be interesting for uh, students, teachers, and the general public as well. It's also a website that's designed to motivate and to agitate for change. That last chapter, I'm just gonna show one final video and I will be done with all of that. This last chapter called Pursuing Justice. In addition to discussing the ways that enslavement slowly um, evaporated in the North, and it took a long time for that to happen, uh, we also try to bring this up to today as well. Uh, one of the uh, videos that I'm going to get to here. Talks about how the North really stopped talking about its role with enslavement. Uh, we heard that a little bit uh, with uh, the Arsley High School students as well. Um, New York tended to, as well as most of the North, once they once they eliminated or once they abolished enslavement, they quickly forgot that they were, in fact, uh, a community that had enslaved thousands, 20,000, more than 20,000 in New York alone. Um, and why did that happen? Well, let's see if we can get to that story a little bit here. Let's see what some of the reasons are. Most of us didn't say grow up hearing a lot about slavery anymore. 
um, during the 19th century, there was a conscious effort to obliterate it from the records. When I'm looking at 19th century primary sources from the colonial period, often any reference to slavery is edited out. So you can imagine that generation upon generation, this starts to be forgotten, and it's very convenient to forget it because we don't really want to remember this dark part of our past. But growing up in Massachusetts, if I can recall, most of what I was being taught at the time about enslavement was the story of cotton in the American South. There was no notion of enslavement in the North. The North was the land of the abolitionists, the anti-slavery societies, uh, the North were the good guys. Slavery ends in most locales in the North by the first half of the 19th century. The North recast itself very quickly as the site of freedom in the aftermath of the Civil War. So they have no interest politically in um, addressing their own history of slavery. Slavery existed in all parts of North America. The records um, from ship companies, from major slave traders in Rhode Island, and research from historians in the 21st and 20th century have revealed that the North was just as connected to slavery as the clothing that enslaved people wore, the shoes that they wore, was shipped from the North to the South. The ships that brought enslaved people from Africa to the Americas were ships that were often built for, operated, and owned by people from Northern communities. They're on burial grounds in New York City, some in Westchester County, and the slaves were there. Why were these people here? How did they get here? And in fact, they did exist because their bones and their remains are there. Historical facts that are right here, tangible at our fingertips, show that there was slavery in the world. It's easy for us to think about slavery as being something that was in the past, it was a long time ago. It's a past that makes us as Americans look bad. It's a past that some of us are embarrassed by. But it's a past that's important because it's part of the American fabric. It's part of who we are today and how we got here. It's important for us to know the full history of American slavery in the North and the South. documentary is designed to do is, well, one thing it's not designed to do is to make you feel sorry for what happened in the past. It's really designed to make you angry about what happened in the past and to motivate people, uh, as the students at Arsley had done, to understand the connections between the past and the present, to want to learn more about this side of the history, the history that doesn't get spoken about, the history that is not discussed in classrooms uh, to the extent that it should be discussed, the understanding, the total um, whole, the whole idea of enslavement developing in these colonies and being so uh, central to the development really of our American nation, of our story. That's what this website is kind of designed to do. Um, when, when Judith had spoken about uh, Phillipsport Manor being a place where uh, the Underground Railroad may have taken place, or certainly within this area, uh, she was referencing uh, uh, an advertisement for a runaway printed in the local New York newspapers for a man named Galloway. This is a 1740 ad. Galloway was a man who was owned by a leather dresser in New York City named John Breeze. And Galloway escaped, ran north out of New York City, and was stopped and questioned at Colonel Phillips' mill, right over here at Phillipsburg Manor, uh, where he was apparently aided by uh, the enslaved individuals at Phillipsburg and managed to um, at least escape Phillipsburg and work his way farther north up to Connecticut where his family apparently had recently been sold from him. There were enslaved individuals helping other enslaved individuals. This was before really what we would call the Underground Railroad. There was no railroad yet in 1740. But there were individuals helping other individuals, aiding and abetting when they could, if they could, and risking uh, significant uh, punishment if they were caught aiding and abetting escaped enslaved individuals. All of this takes place in our own backyard, throughout the river towns, it was all the property of Phillipsburg Manor. The enslaved communities were here. They had been here since the 1600s. Um, and it is a story that takes place under our feet, on the soil that we walk every day. These were stories, these were individuals that lived and worked here 
250, 300 years ago. There's a lot of history to this county, certainly a lot of history to this town, and it's very, um, it's very meaningful, I think, to, to piece together this story of enslavement occurring in our own backyards as well. I urge you to stop by Phillipsburg Manor. I urge you to take a postcard of ours, take a look at the website if you have friends, teachers, individuals that might be interested in this story. They can look this up as well. I hope that it is useful for people. That's why I'm kind of out making the story for this out there for anybody that's willing to hear me. We want people to interact with this story. We want people to understand what was happening up here uh, as a way to make those connections with the issues that are relevant for us today. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate well, thank it. Thank you for uh, this presentation. It was really fascinating. And um, I'm going to create a YouTube video of uh, both presentations. And um, then I'll um, share it with the community. You know, probably send it to the New York Times Magazine. Maybe they'll uh, uh, do this as a uh, follow up to their, uh, their stories. And you know, I just also want to say I really think that uh, Historic Hudson Valley is very fortunate to have you uh, because you definitely are very inspiring. If I, if you, were you a teacher uh, at any point? Uh, more of a public historian, a presenter rather than a teacher. You no, know, because if I had uh, studied under you <laughs> in high school, I probably would have gone into history. <laughs> <laughs> you really. This was really fascinating, and your presentation that Judith coordinated was also, you know, very fascinating. So thank you. Thank you. And the, and the website is really great. Oh, you've had a chance. To well, it was there. Taking was a look at it as well, right? When you were at that week, yeah. Quite frankly, the way you present, you do. Great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, guys. Uh, next.